Hello and welcome to The Journey Home. My guest this evening is, first of all, Lee South, who is the associate producer, an associate producer here at EWTN. She's here to share her journey into the church. Joining her later will be Father Lambert Greenan, a Dominican, an Irish Dominican priest who will be joining us to talk about the theme tonight. The theme is the theme of annulments, or maybe more specifically, the effect that conversion has on marriage. This is probably a topic we could often speak about with a great number of the guests, because when guests come from other Christian traditions that have different ideas about divorce and remarriage, and then the, the, the person comes into the Catholic Church, we're often confronted with the impact of decisions that we've made in the past. And also in our uh, journey tonight, we'll hear as Lee shares her own journey to the Catholic Church before her husband made his journey. And her husband, Ned South, joined us a couple months ago sharing his journey as an Episcopal priest. So Lee will talk about her journey as the wife of an Episcopal clergyman coming into the church. Now you're an all, always an important part of our program. So remember to call us, start calling us now with your questions at 1-800-221-9460 or send us an email at journeyhome at EWTN.com. Lee, welcome to the program. Thank you, Marcus. I'm delighted to be here. Well, you're usually on the other side helping schedule guests and helping Doug Keck with all of his production work and then now I, I uh, bamboozled you to get here on this side of the camera. <laughs> because we've known about your journey here and right now the audience at home doesn't realize that we have a very large audience here in the studio praying uh, in support uh, about talking about your journey. It's not always yeah. easy to talk about all aspects of the journey. That's right. So why don't we begin as okay. we usually do, give the audience a bit of your background. All right. My twin sister and I were adopted in uh, San Francisco by a wonderful John Wayne, Maureen O'Hara kind of couple. Uh, they were just very dynamic, exuded optimism and confidence. They sent us at the age of two and a half to a Dominican convent nursery school in San Rafael, California. And Which w wasn't representative of where they were coming from spiritually? No, not at all. They were <laughs> Presbyterians. Okay. Um, yeah. I think they wanted us to learn how to curtsy, be well brought up, uh, speak French. Um, but with that, we got all that, but we also got a deep love for Mary as our mother. Um, we learned that the saints were our older brothers and sisters, um, our uh, heroes to be imitated. We learned that we had guardian angels and they were always watching over us. I think my parents were a little bit dismayed when all this came home in the afternoon. Um, but I totally fell in love with Dominican Convent. The grounds were much like the setting of EWTN here in Birmingham. Beautiful statues, uh, flowers, chapel, uh, uh -huh. incense, nuns in crisp white linen, rosaries clicking uh, as they walked. Um, A I, very reflective environment? Yes. For you? Yes, very, very contemplative. Yeah. I really thought I was in the Garden of Eden when I was little. <laughs> it was awesome. Well, when, when we were 10, we moved to Ohio for a year and then to Florida. And my father told me later that, well, the move to Ohio anyway had been a disaster, but <laughs> at least it had taken me out of Dominican convent because... <laughs> that was they, his... Right. They, they <laughs> were quite, quite worried that, that I was going to grow up and become a nun. So... <laughs> so in uh, Fort Lauderdale, um, went to high school there and really put God on the back burner. Um, still had a few holy cards and a rosary, a few medals that I kept in a bottom dresser drawer, but really didn't talk much about God. Um, went to Agnes Scott College, good Presbyterian college, uh, alma mater of Catherine Marshall, oh, who yes. of course met Peter Marshall at Columbia Theological Seminary. Mm -hmm. Uh, didn't didn't meet anybody at Columbia Theological Seminary. Uh, had a few dreary dates with some Georgia Tech engineers and transferred my sophomore year to Vanderbilt to be with my sister. 
um, went to France to study, came back and found out that Campus Crusade for Christ had invaded the Vanderbilt campus and that all my friends had gotten involved. So I got involved too. Mm -hmm. And it was a revelation to me that God had a wonderful plan for my life. The, the spiritual The laws. four spiritual laws. Right. Right. So I, I, I thought that was wonderful. Mm -hmm. And in the spring of my senior year, Bill Bright, founder of Campus Crusade, came to campus and uh, asked me to come on staff. And unbeknownst to many people, I had a terrible stuttering problem, which I had learned to conceal over the years by some elaborately planned phrases. I don't think anyone but another fellow stutterer can begin to appreciate the agony of uh, speaking in unrehearsed moments. And when you're in Campus Crusade, you have to recruit your own financial support. And I the thought of doing that totally uh, totally overwhelmed me. And so I told Mr. Bright, I said, I'm, I'm so sorry. I just uh, don't think I'm ready. So instead, I went to graduate school. Let me uh, say something here. Yeah. That the fact that he would invite you to be on staff, right. to me, is a clear recognition of where you were in your relationship with Christ at that point. I mean, Bill Bright recognizes that not only you have a deep commitment, but you can share your faith, though, at that point. I, I mean, get, it's a statement of your commitment right, at that right. point. Well, thank you. I, Thank you. Well, I want to make sure that, right. that our audience hears that in the journey, because it was an important part that, right. you, you said, you had been attracted to the Campus Crusade, a rebirth right. of your own faith right. in Christ. Right. Uh, enough that the leader, the founder of, of Campus Crusade, would call right. you to be a part of the staff. Right. I'm sorry, I didn't mean that. No, no. So instead, I um, went to graduate school, dated and married a handsome young law student. Um, who got drafted, these were the Vietnam years, mm -hmm. sent to the Canal Zone. Um, actually, after he was sent to the Canal Zone, we decided we were both very lonely. We decided to get married. And uh, we were very young. Uh, the marriage did not last, largely because I had no idea of how to handle conflict. My mm -hmm. modus operandi was to be a peacemaker to pour oil on the troubled waters. That was my role in the family, and I really didn't know how to handle conflict. So the marriage did produce a wonderful, wonderful son, Paul, who works here at EWTN. Um, sometimes behind the camera. Yes, sometimes behind the camera. So um, about 20 years ago, I met and married Ned South, who was then an Episcopal clergyman. Uh, he had a wonderful parish in Huntsville, Alabama, and I um, totally loved the vocation, I called it, of clergy wife. Mm -hmm. I um, had wonderful friends. I had very meaningful work. There was that noble calling that I had turned yeah. away from with Campus Crusade. Uh, we had two wonderful, great children, um, so I was entirely happy. We, we were there for about 12 years. And then Ned accepted a call to a parish in Northeast Ohio. And I was heartbroken. My roots were now in Huntsville, Alabama. My parents had died, and uh, Huntsville was the family I knew. My friends were all advising me, just tell them you won't go. Just, and I, I, I knew in my heart of hearts, and, and if you knew Ned, you, know, you would know that too, that I couldn't say that. So I tried to pretend that I was Sarah and Abraham was dragging me out of Ur, you know, to a land that God would show him. Um, but I didn't, um, you know, it didn't work very well. And about six months after our move, I took Paul, who was then 15 years old, with me on a pilgrimage to Medjugorje. Why did I, get, why did I go? Because I, I had some money saved up from my good government job in Huntsville. And, because I, I had heard of Medjugorje from a former parishioner. And uh, I was just miserable in Ohio. I just mm -hmm. wanted to get away and escape and think things over. Um, well, Medjugorje was wonderful for me. It was a turning point. It reawakened that love of Catholicism. Yeah. 
it was an atmosphere of God. God was truly present to me there. Um, I had a couple of very unusual experiences that convinced me that God, beyond a shadow of a doubt, was crazy about me, had really plans, plans for me, and wanted me to trust him. So I came away from Medjugorje. Had Ned been supportive of your trip to, to Medjugorje? He really was, you know, sweetheart, whatever, <laughs> whatever it takes to make you happy, just go and I'll take care of Katie and Joshua. You go with Paul and have a good time. He was very supportive and always has been. Hmm. Um, so I went back a, a few more years in a row and Ned went with me on some of those. And each time I just felt hmm. tiny whisperings uh, this could be for you. Uh, it was, I guess it is similar to when you go on a retreat, perhaps, to yeah. see if, um, say, a calling to the priesthood or the religious life is for you. Yeah. Uh, I was free to be nobody there. I wasn't playing a role. I was free to do what everyone else did or not do what anyone else did. And I just... Uh, I had a wonderful spiritual director, Father Chris DeFazio, in fact, who lives in Birmingham. Um, he encouraged me in his very Casey Stengel kind of way. Um, so I started praying. I started really praying. I said, God, if this is what you want me to do, please open the doors that will need to be opened. But if it's not, you know, if, if this is just a selfish desire born out of perhaps resentment at, at the move to Ohio, please just close those doors. I'm, I'm, I think I'm willing to do whatever you say. Um, and I knew that I wanted to receive the Holy Eucharist if I could ever be so fortunate as to be confirmed in the Catholic Church. And to do that, I would need to obtain an annulment. Well, this was, this was a major hurdle. Um, I didn't want to admit that I had failed in my first marriage. I had a wonderful relationship with Paul's father. I couldn't even imagine bringing that up with him although I knew that that was not uh, something I would have to do, but I wanted to do it. Was Paul, what, what tradition was Paul? Um, Paul was Episcopalian. Episcopalian yes, also, okay. yes. I mean, your ex-husband. Right, right. Yes, okay. right. Um, uh, wonderful, generous, you know, pillar of the community, yeah. uh, Episcopalian. And then also, I'd, I'd never known anyone who'd obtained an annulment, I, I mean, you know, annulment, isn't that for tabloids, you know? <laughs> isn't that a slap in the face, an insult, an attack? I, annulment, you know, that, that was the antithesis of everything I represented. Uh, so, but, you know, I think God lets you be uncomfortable for a while in your uh, failings, your foibles, and finally I decided, well, you know, I can sit down in the middle of the road and cry about this and wish I were Catholic for the rest of my life, or I can do something about it. And when I made that decision, God opened some doors, um, had me meet a wonderful Catholic priest who uh, brought me some papers, some forms about it, just said, I'm here when and if you want to talk about it, go through with it. And he was so encouraging, so supportive, that that I decided to first look at the papers, and then <laughs> one one summer I I filled them out, and it was an exhausting process. Uh, I would uh, exhausting because of yeah, exhausting what you emotionally. Can dig into, yeah. 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 yeah, it's about um, well, this was from the Tribunal of Cleveland, and it was about 50 questions, kind of an autobiography of your life, uh, but very healing as well. Uh, 
so I filled that out, sent it in, and um, about nine, ten months later, the decision came back From that the tribunal, the right, tribunal. right, an affirmative decision that a declaration of nullity had been granted. So then I had that. Right. So then I, I thought, okay, um, how can I go to an RCAA program in this little town where we live? I mean, everyone will know. See, there's the pride coming out. So little I town because that's where your husband right, was, was, it right. was the Episcopal right, right. minister in that town. Right. Right, and, uh, just down the road. Sometimes right. mixed marriages, right, between sure. Episcopalians and Catholics. Sure, okay. yeah, sure. So I went to um, Father Fred Pauschi, the uh, priest at St. Gabriel's in Concord Township, Ohio, and, and, and I asked him would he homeschool me, as it were, uh, so I could do all this sub rosa. And he said, well, okay. You know, I could tell he wasn't thrilled, but... I uh, persuaded him. So we, we did that for a few months. And then after a few months, I just saw that something wasn't working. And Father Fred, in his infinite wisdom, finally said to me, you know, Lee, people will talk about this for a little while. And then they'll go on to something else. You know, the, the main thing is, where, where do you find Jesus? You know, be very sure of that before you proceed any further. So somewhat chastened, I went home, and I thought about that for, for another three or four months. And then the following September, with the um, full approval of my family, uh, and I even told the Episcopal uh, Bishop of the Diocese what I intended to do, and he gave that his blessing. I entered the RCIA program at St. Gabriel's, which was every Friday night from September until the following yeah. Easter. And Ned was um, planning on uh, coming with me, and he did for a couple of those Friday nights. But after that, he said, sweetheart, um, why don't you just do this on your own? <laughs> said, but I will pick you up every Friday night at 9.30, and we'll go to Applebee's, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about so what So it had a on. great result, right, at least in the right. first stages of a, a date every Friday night. Right? right, it did. So we started <laughs> talking after a long time, really, of you huh. know, raising children and doing good for the parish. And so we started talking, and that, and that following um, Easter, I was confirmed, and my sponsor was a wonderful woman, Linda Katnack, whom I met eight years ago in Medjugorje. So it was really an eight-year process from Medjugorje, uh, confirmed in 1996. So you came in in 1996? Yes. All right. Mm -hmm. Now, we're going to take a break in a little bit, but not quite yet. I want you to talk about now you're a Catholic wife of an Episcopal <laughs> pastor. Right. King, right? right? <laughs> talk about the struggles right. of that, okay. both for yourself and for okay. Ned. All right. Um, well, the, the next step was how best to tell the parish. Yeah. Yeah. We assumed some people knew. And, yeah. sure they knew. and we thought about several options, but none of them seemed exactly right. And the best decision seemed to be wait. So that summer of 96, Ned had been granted a sabbatical for a month. And he decided to take us all to Europe, um, in, including Medjugorje and Rome. That sounds like the direct approach to telling your <laughs> congregation. <laughs> yeah, right. And so we heard, uh, you probably remember those days, you know, rumors sometimes get started in churches, yeah. that Ned was going to Rome to be received oh. by the Holy Father as a Catholic priest. <laughs> <laughs> and when Ned told me that, I think I was in the middle of a teacher's meeting, and I was so taken aback. I. I sat down, instead of taking notes of the teacher's meeting, and wrote out my apologia, you know, where, where I had been. Because yeah. poor Ned, it wasn't his problem, it was my problem. <laughs> and I said, sweetheart, please let me, during the sermon time, share my story. And mm -hmm. he said, okay. So, so I, I did. A couple weeks before we left for Europe, I um, got up and just uh, shared with them where where I had been. I said that that I was very, very happy. The decision really had nothing to do with the Episcopal Church, but where 
um, I found Christ Jesus. And um, that, you know, if they loved me before, this was who I was before inside. And if they didn't like me much before, I doubted that this little revelation would uh, endear me to them. But this was who I was, and I, and I hoped the same happiness for all of them. And um, that I would not, uh, obviously they probably had noticed, I would not be receiving the Holy Eucharist at that altar, but I would be praying for them while they did. So um, that was done, and then we went off to to uh, Rome and to Medjugorje and to England. And in fact, we were in St. Peter's for the Feast of St. Peter and Paul. And when when the Holy Father came down the aisle, Ned just burst into tears. <laughs> and I, I think that was the beginning of his conversion. Yes, yeah. Well, let's take a break now. Okay. We'll, take, we'll be back just a moment, and we'll talk a little bit with uh, Father Lambert about the issue of annulment. We have lots of questions about that. Uh, and then we'll begin taking some of your questions, both by phone and email, on this and other issues. So be with us in just a moment. Welcome back. My guest is, uh, was first of all Lee South, as she uh, shared with us her journey into the Catholic faith, and then joining us also is Father Lambert Greenan, a uh, Dominican priest. Got a, a very interesting uh, dossier here. You were you, a professor of canon law in Ireland. You could tell by your accent that you weren't from Birmingham. The, the audience at home will know right away that you weren't from Birmingham, Alabama. It may sound a little bit like Birmingham, England, <laughs> but to, to us, but not Birmingham, Alabama. The founding editor of the English version of L'Observo Romano, the Vatican newspaper, edited for 22 years, so he's quite an expert uh, and informed on all the, the happenings uh, of the Vatican. Uh, while in Rome, you served as a confessor at the Basilica of St. Mary Major in Rome. It's a beautiful church, a beautiful church. And you're currently the chaplain of the Casa Maria Retreat Center in Irondale, Alabama, right around the corner. So welcome. We, we, we invite you here to put you on the spot on this very easy issue of annulments. And this is an issue that not only could deserve an entire program, but probably a series because of all the misconceptions uh, and questions about annulment. But I posed three or four questions to the two of you, and then we want to begin with your phone calls and emails as soon as we can. But the, probably the place to begin, especially given the fact that so many of our audience who come from other Christian traditions, different understandings of divorce and remarriage, what does the Catholic Church mean when it says annulment? Well, first of all, I think we ought to distinguish between divorce and annulment, because very often they are confused. Divorce means the termination of a real valid marriage. The annulment is a recognition that a marriage did not exist. Okay. Now, the marriage may have appeared to have existed. That would be called a putative marriage. They went through a form of marriage. Everybody thought they were married. Then something happens. It may be that they break up and they're looking for an examination oh. of their original marriage oh. to see was it really a valid marriage or not. <coughs> now, there are many reasons why yeah. it could have been an invalid marriage. By way of example, there might have been some invalidating impediment, but more generally it would be with regard to the consent. Mm. When a person is consenting to marriage, 
the consent should be to a real, a real marriage, yeah. with all its obligations, with all its attendant uh, qualities. Now, two important qualities of marriage are unity and indissolubility. If a person enters marriage with the idea, well, if it doesn't work out for after a few months, we can get a divorce, you know. Well, that means that the, the marriage that they're entering into is a short-term contract. It's not a marriage at all, as, as we understand marriage in the Christian sense. So, therefore, they did not have the intention of undertaking the obligation of indissolubility. Or it might have been a question, I'll say, of the unity of marriage. In other words, I'm not going to be content with, with one wife, but, you know, <laughs> you, know <laughs> you know what I mean? Yep. yep, yep. <laughs> of course. <laughs> so, they wouldn't have that... We don't have time on the program to go into all the details. But yes, so they don't just have the idea of having that, having that uh, unity of marriage. Take another example, for instance. They enter the idea of marriage, they're not going to have children. We mm. don't want to have children. Now, the primary, ob uh, primary object of marriage, of course, you should know, is the procreation of children. Mm. So if you exclude that, obviously there's no marriage. Mm. So they may enter into the thing, well, we're going to have no children whatsoever. Or we're going to, we're going to practice contraception. Or things like that, you know. Yeah. So th many of these things can influence the consent. There's very one, a very one important thing and uh, it is with regard to the consent. Yes, it's here. Matrimonial consent. I just want to read this to you. It's a short thing. The following are incapable of contracting marriage. Those who lack sufficient use of reason. Those who suffer from a grave lack of discretionary judgment concerning the essential matrimonial rights and obligations to be mutually given and accepted. I already know I mentioned that. Mm -hmm. Those who, because of causes of a psychological nature, are unable to assume the essential obligations of marriage. Mm -hmm. That gives you some idea of the reasons to investigate a marriage. Was this marriage really valid or not? In the first assault and annulment isn't declaring something new, it's determining the marriage yeah. never existed. Ne whether it never existed or not. It never let's, existed. Let's say, and we, let's maybe a couple other quick uh, comments, and then we'll go, we know we have questions already. Um, let, let's say that uh, someone might be listening who examines these things and wonders in their own marriage whether they have a valid marriage or not. First of all, what's the reasons and benefits that one should go through this process? Because as you mentioned, it can be difficult at a time. What are the, the benefits of this process? It was very, very hard, um, but also very, very healing, kind of a healing uh, justice and mercy. T uh, told me things about myself I could have learned no other way. I think that the Lord, uh, in his infinite wisdom, pr uh, probably had me go through it, because in no other way could I have learned that uh, the faulty patterns of uh, reasoning of judgment um, I I had to be brought to um, to my knees yeah. to say you know Lord I help me you know help me see myself help me you know grow from this you know, that, that Romans 828 passage all things work together for good to those that love God are called according to his purpose I mean there's God taking something that wasn't perfect Right. and helping you grow through that. Mm -hmm. uh, there are also some very valid reasons that, that it's very necessary if someone but needs it and all that. Marcus, just before we mm -hmm. go on to that, yes. there's one very important thing I wish to mention, which is this. And it's always uh, coming up in the question of annulment. People resent the very idea of an annulment because it means declaring that these children who yeah. were already born are illegitimate. This is the thing that they're always yeah. frightened about. Mm -hmm. Now, I want just to read just two sentences here. It is, an invalid marriage, an invalid marriage, that's what we're considering uh -huh. now when we're dealing with numbers, an invalid marriage is said to be putative. If it has been celebrated in good faith by at least one party, 
It ceases to be such when both parties become certain of its nullity. Now, with regard to the children, children who are conceived or born of a valid or of a putative marriage are legitimate. So that disposes of that objection of which that people often have. Okay. But now, with regard to the other matter, I think uh, the matter you want to discuss is why should people go through with it? Well, it means that people nowadays may find that they've met somebody else, they may have got married to somebody else, they've divorced, they've got married to somebody else, and they want to, they want to, if they're Catholics, they want to return to the practice of their religion. They cannot do so while they're in this state, because objectively speaking, objectively they're living in a state of adultery, objectively speaking, according to the law. So therefore, it is essential for them to have the marriage examined to see by any chance was there any ground for uh, recognizing this as an invalid marriage and therefore obtaining a decree of annulment to assure them that the marriage had never existed, a, a very necessary thing to do. The tribunal, of course, you have be already been mm. explaining all the procedure, the questions you've got to answer and all that. But uh, I think it is necessary if they're going to return to the, to the practice of the religion. Yeah. It emphasizes the importance of the sacramental aspect of our of our faith and the seriousness seriousness with which the Catholic Church holds marriage and God's uh, commandments dealing yeah. with marriage. It takes it very seriously, which we should too, not just once we're married, but as we train men and women to consider marriage. Uh, Do you know, there's one point I'd like to mention to you, Marcus, it's this. People often make the accusation, oh, you Catholics, you've got divorce too, you call it annulment. But the annulment machine is just divorce. This is a question you've often heard this yes. said. Yeah. Now, I want to point out certain things. Number one, uh, after the council, shortly after the council, I was reading some statistics recently, and it said that, let us say, the number of annulments here might be in one year, might be, say, 300 in a year. And more or less that. And then suddenly, after the council, jumps one year to 3,000. Then it jumped to 7,000. You know? And you begin to ask yourself, I mean, what's going on? What is this? And uh, then you find that there are more annulments granted in the United States than in the rest of the entire Catholic world put together. So uh, I said to someone recently, uh, the the person had put to me that on this question of psychological immaturity, that many of the marriages were recognized as being invalid on ground of psychological immaturity. I think it's true because of this erotic culture in which we are living. Mm -hmm. People are no longer prepared to make a commitment for life. And uh, I said, well, does it mean then that if there are so many so many enormous granted that such a large percentage, you say, a large percentage of the population of America are not sufficiently mature, psychologically mature, to enter into a valid marriage. <laughs> I said, is that what it is? <laughs> well, he said, it might appear that way. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, I think I'm not blaming individuals or criticizing individuals. I'm referring to the surrounding culture yes. in which we are living. Yeah. And it's not merely with regard to marriage, you know. Mm -hmm. It's with regard to the priesthood. I it's, it's with regard to religious life. People are not prepared to make a commitment for life, a permanent commitment. Seems to be fighting shy of it in our modern culture. Yeah, if anything, the 20th century was certainly a battle uh, on marriage, a battle on relationships. A, a, a husband uh, to wife, man to man, woman to woman, man to woman, adult to child. Every relationship has been suspect in our culture and it's made it very difficult. We have the media that is teaching a different understanding of love than is you know, comparable to our own teachings of the church. And so we can see that this would, in fact, make it difficult for young men and women to maybe hear what marriage is supposed to be like as they make their journey in. I'm sure that we've got some... Uh, we got our first email, so why don't we begin with this and we maybe slip some of the other questions in. This comes from BG in Texas. Hello. Long before I ever thought of becoming a Catholic, 
I was involved in a marriage that was annulled. Does the church recognize that annulment, or will I have to go through the process of getting an annulment through the church? In other words, they were on the other side. Their spouse uh, went through the annulment process while they were still a non-Catholic. The marriage was annulled. Now they're thinking of becoming a Catholic. Do they have to go through the process again? I don't quite understand the question. Does, okay. he, does he mean that uh, the two of them sought an annulment outside of the Catholic Church? Was it from the state? No, but, but in this case, here we have the uh, husband and wife, non-Catholics, divorced. Mm. Okay, And it seems that the, the spouse originally was going to come into the church, went through the annulment process, yes. had the marriage annulled, yes. be, while he is still oh, yes. Uh, Protestant, but now he's thinking of becoming Catholic. Does he need to go through the whole process again? Oh, not at all. Not at all. Not at all. The marriage is annulled. Okay. The marriage never existed, and the church has recognized that. So he's free to marry again. And if he becomes a Catholic, he's free to marry again. That's right. No problem. And see, that, that emphasizes what the, the decree of annulity is. They weren't doing something to declare something new for one spouse, and now they got declared for the other. They were examining the marriage that was, whether it truly The marriage was didn't certain. exist, and therefore it has been declared as not, not having existed. So that's valid for both of them. All right. Let's take our next email. This says, Your little brother in Christ, Marion in Kansas. Dear Marcus, I have a dear friend who attends daily Mass and rarely misses. Over 20 years ago, she had divorced and remarried outside of the faith. Several years ago, she returned to the faith but cannot receive the Eucharist. She wants to correct her marital situation and has talked to her parish, to our parish priest about getting an annulment. The necessary papers were obtained, but her husband, who is anti-Catholic, refuses to fill his part out. What can be done in such a situation? Uh, That's probably a common situation where you have one very interested spouse and the other one not only not interested, but fighting the process. Well, if, if he refuses to cooperate, there's no problem. They can and go to the bishop, go to the tribunal, and they will deal with it from that point of view. They can hear from the one side and then judge whether they've got sufficient information or not. Okay. And they take that into consideration. That's not going to prevent the thing from going ahead. Which is an important process, because the, the goal of the annulment process is not to be uncharitable to any of the parties involved. Well, the supreme law here is the salus animarum, the salvation of souls, isn't yeah, that so? That's right. That's what's behind the whole thing. So therefore, for that reason, the, the, the church can go ahead and... Okay. Let's take our first caller. Hello, Barbara. What's your uh, question for us this evening? Yes, my question is for Mrs. Salus. Yes. Um, my question is for Mrs. Salus. I have a daughter who has left the Catholic Church and is now a member of the Episcopalian Church. And my question is, what kinds of things might you suggest for me to do or to say that might steer her back home? Thank you, Barbara. You, you, you may have um, known even yeah. people from your yeah. past that have had the same situation. Yeah. So what are some um, things you might suggest for Barbara? Well, I would certainly, I know that um, I've made many errors in my life because I have spoken rather than prayed. Um, mm. uh, even with our nearest and dearest, we don't always know where they're coming from and why they do what they do. Um, I would certainly, certainly pray for her. Um, you know, if she's young, if she's in her teens or her twenties, it's yeah. pretty natural, really, to look around. Um, you know, I, there's a sense in which the guest after guest after guest on the journey home is a word of encouragement uh -huh. uh, that even those of us that were prodigals, right. the Lord can bring back. Right. And so, as you said, never give up praying. Right. Uh, I always hate it when I see a, a parent who's upset with a, a child's decision in this and then cuts it off. Mm -hmm. That's the last thing. Yeah. Right. There's got to be the love and the right. charity to keep the channels open. Right. Father, do you have any advice also for this? Yes, but of course, remembering St. Monica, the problem she had with, with her <laughs> Tell son. us more about St. Monica for those that aren't familiar. Well, St. Monica was the mother of St. Augustine, and you all about St. Augustine. He had a rather <laughs> interesting life before, he had, before his conversion. 
But she kept on praying and praying and praying. And um, St. Augustine eventually came back to the faith, came back to the practice of religion. But one thing I would say in this case, very often when parents react sharply and cut off their children, cut off communication with them because they've done this, we've t left the faith and all that, very often they feel they feel guilty themselves, they feel embarrassed because they feel that they are uh, had been lacking in some way. They did not sufficiently instruct them in the faith and that. So I would say it's very necessary for them, and for the mother especially, to keep close to her daughter. Let not this uh, lead to a breaking off. Keep close and be friendly and helpful and all that. And, you know, in that way, perhaps, and through prayer, we'll be able to bring her back again. And the daughter might be influenced by that attitude of her mother, that loving, caring attitude. And I know of many who have left the church and for whatever reason in their early process had not found a deep relationship with Christ and then in moving out found and experienced a wonderful reawakening with Christ which eventually led them back to the church so this could be a wonderful process of God's guidance in this person's life so I always trust what God can do let's take our uh, next email this uh, uh, says thank you and God bless I have always been an Episcopalian and was married at an early age to a non-Christian. We were divorced, and I have been married for almost 40 years to a wonderful Christian man. If I wanted to join the Catholic Church, would I have to have an annulment? I think in this case, she's still there's still, still a, a bit of a misunderstanding about what annulment would mean. Well, she was married to a non-Christian. Yeah. But that marriage might not be not a sacramental marriage, not a sacramental uh, not a what you call a ratified marriage, sanctioned by the church, mm. not a sacramental marriage, but what we call a legitimate marriage. It was a, ma a valid marriage, either between two non-baptized people or a marriage between a baptized person and a non-baptized person. It is not a sacramental marriage, but it is a legitimate marriage, but a valid marriage. Mm. And therefore, if what seemed to be a valid marriage uh, existed, then uh, obviously if they wish to get married again uh, after the divorce, they would have to have the marriage, the original marriage examined to see was it really, hmm. did it measure up to the full terms of validity? Was it really a valid marriage? And therefore they'd have to seek uh, through the process of annulment, yeah. seeking the decree that of annulment. Mm. Right, so. uh, again, it's taken very seriously the church's belief in Christ's teachings about marriage and about divorce and, the, and against remarriage? Well, that is one and thing which was emphasized in this uh, document which came out the other day with regard to this very matter, you know, there last week. Yes. Where the, the, the council, the pontifical council for the interpretation of legislative texts, they give an authentic interpretation of that canon in the code and pointed out that when people are married, divorced and remarried, they are now in a state, objectively speaking, in a state of grave sin. And therefore, they cannot approach the, the Eucharist, cannot receive the Eucharist. So if they are to, to be readmitted to the Eucharist, then their position must be rectified. And, and since they entered into um, marriage, the original marriage, it was, what you say, in the external forum. And therefore, it's not sufficient to say, oh, in the internal form, this is not valid enough, or I recognize it's not valid, and I, allow, I tell you, you can come along. No, no, it's not a question of the internal form. It's a question of the external form, and therefore, it must be recognized as invalid in the external form. Mm -hmm. uh, we might need to describe what we mean by internal and external forms to some well, people. The internal form is the uh, form of conscience. Okay. You see, like, like the confessional, for instance, form yeah. of conscience. The external form is is the form of, of, the, of the public order, okay. of the church public order of society. All right. The ordinary uh, public government, either of society or of the church, external form. Another thing, uh, maybe quick clarification just to be sure, and that is for those that might wonder, well, why can't a person who has not received an annulment or who who's is remarried and then their previous marriage has not been, why can't they receive the sacrament? Well, what's right. wrong? Uh, yes, well, <laughs> the answer is because they're living, they're, they're living in a state of uh, public sin. Okay. And what does St. Paul say within 1 Corinthians, remember? But he who eats and drinks the, uh, eats the body of Jesus and drinks his blood unworthily, 
is eating and drinking damnation unto himself. And therefore, it, it is an offence, an offence against the Eucharist, an offence against matrimony. Because we've got to recognise the indissolubility of marriage. Christ said, what God has joined together, let no man put asunder. They were thinking to, to catch him out, the two people, Hillel and Shammai, whatever you call it. Mm -hmm. And one of these people allowed it for any any occasion, any cause, even a slight defect, or if she burnt the dinner or something like that, yeah. she could be divorced. But the other said, no, only for certain grave matters. So they came along to Jesus. But yeah. And they say, now, which, uh, which school do you belong to? Which you? And he just says, neither. <laughs> neither. You can't, what God has joined together, let no man put us under for any reason whatsoever. Yeah. 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 All right. You know, um, there was another off-topic question that I did want to bring up here, uh, and we're still I think, working through some phone calls and emails, but it's an important question. Uh, it does have to do with annulment, but it has to do also what you found in your spiritual journey mm -hmm. to the Catholic Church, and that is a discovery of Catholic spirituality and uh, what an important part that was in your own journey. Talk about that a bit, Marcelie. Yeah. Um, well, Mother Angelica, I think, says it all at the beginning of her show. We're all called to be great saints. Um, I had always been fascinated by heaven. I wanted to go there. I never seemed to find much of a game plan in, in the Episcopal Church for getting there and never much mention of the saints and their writings. Mm -hmm. It was perhaps optional, let's say. Um, when I became Catholic, a treasure trove of Catholic wisdom and literature was open to me. Um, I, um, I discovered St. Teresa of Avila. I discovered St. John of the Cross. I am a beginner in serious prayer, but I want to get to heaven. You know, I, I, uh, it's, well, and, and we, um, I know you're interested in this subject, too. Oh, very too. much so. And, and it's just, uh, one of the things that I found that, that was so contradictory to what many people think about what we call mystical theology is that there is no more practical theology than mystical theology because what it is is helping us practically grow closer to Christ, right. to have an intimate relationship with Christ. And the one sad thing that was thrown out with the bathwater in the Reformation was the tremendous heritage that we have through the saints and the great spiritual writers of our spirituality. Uh, and sadly, if you look at the history of the Protestant movements, we have so many denominations reinventing the wheel every time on what it means and how do you get to heaven. Right, right. And St. Teresa of Avila, St. John of the Cross are, are pure gospel. Yes. Um, lived the gospel generously and their writings teach us how. Um, yeah. Um, Father Thomas Dubay here at the network, Father Benedict Rochelle, just And there have been a few awesome good Dominicans that have yes. taught us some spiritual things, yes. Father. <laughs> uh, St. Thomas Aquinas oh, yes, and yes. Uh, Dominic himself. And there's no, there's a, no ism like Thomism. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. But, but with regard to this matter which Lee mentions, uh, St. Uh, Teresa of Avila, she's a great doctor of the church now, uh, and she had brought about her reform in the in the Carmelite order because I think it was in, in need of reform at that time. Many orders were in need of reform. But she was wanting to reform the Carmelites and she got this young priest, John of the Cross, to help her in the reform. And he suffered an awful lot, you know. He had to suffer from his own order because yeah. of his helping out in that matter. It's interesting to note that the present Holy Father, he had been thinking of joining the Carmelites and he had applied to the Carmelites and they did not accept him. <laughs> but he still had that uh, hankering after the Carmelite spirituality and uh, I was in Rome at the University of the Angelica at the same time he was there. Unfortunately I was in the Canon Law faculty, he was in the oh. Theology <laughs> faculty, so we did not meet. Oh, yes. However, um, he wrote his thesis or his doctorate in theology, he wrote his thesis on St. John of the Cross. Mm. And uh, he, his thesis, he had five famous men as his examiners, Cardinal Brown, Cardinal Philippe, 
and uh, Cardinal, uh, uh, the man who was the uh, Cardinal Philippe, and the other man who was the Cardinal, the, the theologian of the Pope, his name will come back to me in a moment. And of course, there was Gary Lagrange, yeah. the great Gary uh, Lagrange. Talking about spirituality. So, anyway, Gary Lagrange had his copy of the Pope's thesis, and he had made his annotations on it, you see, as he went around from page to page annotating his observations. And then Gary Lagrange was a great friend of a Carmelite priest up in the Tunisianum. So, he gave his, since it was with the Guard of John of the Cross, he presented. He presented this to his friend. It was by uh, some student called Waitiwa, you know, and <laughs> he, he might be interested in this, you know. Then, uh, some years ago, Pope, Pope uh, John Paul II, he went on a visit to the Theresianum. So they had this in their archives, oh. you see, and they brought this out, you see, and he began to read it. He was very interested. He went through the whole thing, and I mean, what Gattaca said about this, <laughs> and what Gattaca said about that, you see, and he thought, that they were giving him this as a present. <laughs> and he dearly wanted to have this, <laughs> but they weren't going to let go. <laughs> so they still have it. Oh, that would be beautiful to read, John Paul's reflection on John Paul, and then the reflections of Garrigou Lagrange. Garrigou Lagrange, and, Lagrange, and, he, oh, and of course, John Paul himself was very interested to see what Garrigou had to say We about need to it. get someone to sneak in and publish that. Uh, that would be a wonderful yeah, reflection. Yeah. We're, we're running out of time. Let's take one more email, if we could, and then one last question for you. This, this email, dear Marcus, from Katie from Iowa. Just how personal does the marriage tribunal get when you go before them? And that's probably something that holds people back a little bit. Is it terribly embarrassing? And if so, why? Um, well, I did not uh, appear before a tribunal. I sent in my paperwork and was notified by letter, so I did not go before a tribunal. That's right, yeah. um, That's right. But the, what about the questions in the um, They itself? were not uh, embarrassing. They were really um, God shining his light on your life. They were uh, painful but necessary to... Uh, Go through if you are serious about um, a little bit of purging. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. yes, yes, a lot of purging. It um, really very common sense, down to earth, and made you think. My goodness, why didn't I ever think of this before? You know, how could I not have seen this? Let's, with uh, I think maybe a minute or so to go. Uh, I usually like to ask, how has becoming a Catholic drawn you closer in your walk to Jesus Christ? Um, when I was uh, in, as Dante says in his Inferno, in a frightful forest with no visible path, um, it was as though I looked around and the Catholic Church said to me, I'm, I'm the Bride of Christ. I've, I've got the love and the beauty and the deep communion with God that you're seeking. Um, and I've got the saints to help you along the way. I've got the Holy Eucharist to nourish you. And if you die along the way, don't worry about it. You're on the journey home. Um. <laughs> thank you very much for that. Thank you for sharing your journey with us. Father, and thank you for joining us. Would you... Would you end us, close us with a, a, maybe especially a prayer for those that might be struggling with these issues and a blessing? <coughs> well, Holy Spirit, hear our prayers tonight for all those who are, who are involved in these troubles with regard to annulment. Guide them and direct them and bring them safely home. We ask you this through Jesus Christ the Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Lee, thank you so much for joining, sharing in. Some of the parts of this were not always easy when you start bringing up these issues, but as you and I talked earlier, it was to be so helpful for those watching. And Father, it was great to have you and your expertise, even a little inside there on John Paul. Uh, like I said, we've got to get someone to publish that book. That'd be a great one to have. <laughs> and thank you for joining us on the journey home. I hope you enjoy both the journeys and our discussion of sometimes uh, embarrassing complicated subjects, but as Lee and I said, we knew this was one that many of you need to confront, need to pray about, and need to hear the Lord's guidance. So thank you for joining us on the journey home. See you again next week.